gentlemen, the Mayor of Clarence, Alderman Doug Chipman. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you. Um, before proceeding, we do have an annual general meeting first, and uh, we'll straight after we finish that meeting, we'll commence the normal council meeting. In the meantime, I'll ask uh, the general manager to open with the council prayer. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this council, direct and prosper its deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of the city of Clarence. Amen. Amen. Before proceeding, I'd like to acknowledge the Tasmanian Aboriginal community as the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on tonight and pay our respects to elders past and present and remind everyone as well that the meeting is being recorded audio-visually and will be available on our website later this week. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, I'll declare the annual general meeting officially open and um, note an apology from my colleague, the Deputy Mayor, Alderman Chong. Uh, by way of introduction to the Alderman, uh, Alderman Tony Mulder, Alderman Wendy Kendi, Alderman Dean Newington, Alderman James Walker, Alderman John Pearce, Alderman Brendan Blomby, Alderman Luke Edmonds, Alderman Sharon Von Berto, Alderman Richard James, and Alderman Beth Bryant. Thank you. Uh, meeting procedures um, are as they would normally apply for a, a normal council meeting, so I won't go through those in detail. Um, the uh, first <coughs> action item is the confirmation of the minutes of the 2018 annual general meeting as circulated. If I could have a move in a second, please. Thank you, Alderman Piers. Have a second. Uh, thanks, Alderman Walker. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Put the motion. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Uh, item six is the annual report, and it comprises two parts. Firstly, a presentation <coughs> um, from myself, and then secondly, the financial report to be presented by Chief Financial Officer. Um, this last year has been a year of growth and opportunity for the City of Clarence and a year of great change for Clarence City Council with the implementation of a new information technology system called One Council and along with a changeover of our general manager. We've also launched our new whole of council website in November, greatly improving the ability to communicate information, events and services. The new site has improved <coughs> navigation, is responsive to all devices and provides information in a simple, clear format which has seen the page views increase by 117% from the previous year. This year, for the first time, the Council parade into augmented reality with uh, an app out at Richmond which details 16 stories of the history of Richmond and illustrates the significance of the area and offers new ways for visitors to learn more about the region. It's a technology that's being wound out in other areas. Earlier this year we launched Your Say in Clarence, an online community engagement website aimed at increasing <coughs> and improving community engagement across the city using a large toolkit of online and face-to-face -face mediums. Through Your Say Clarence we have already engaged with hundreds of community members from across the municipality on a broad range of issues. The Waverley Flora Park Avenue of Honour and the Armistice Memorial was completed in November and was celebrated with an unveiling and commemorative cel uh, ceremony. The event was very well attended and the park has continued to enjoy, uh, to be enjoyed by the whole community. Works along the Clarence Forshaw Trail have continued with large sections of the trail now completed, providing much improved multi-user trails for the whole community to enjoy. Our commitment to providing an abundance of excellent sport and recreational facilities 
and programs across the city has continued, enabling our community to continue its proud tradition for passion and excellence in health and wellbeing, both physical and mental. Our large regional community parks um, continue to be incredibly popular and are well utilised by both locals and visitors alike of all ages and abilities. I took particular joy from attending part of the consultation process for the new park in Cambridge for which we received a huge amount of feedback from local school children, including drawings and designs submitted that have helped to inform the final park plan, which is available to view online. Other sport and recreational projects included the continuing development of the revised master plan for South, South Arm Oval, which includes many features, such as the skate park and the community market area. Late last year, we launched the Clarence Kayak Trail, which this year won the Award of Excellence for Parks and Open Spaces projects in the Australian Institute of Landscape Architects uh, in Tasmania. The Kayak Trail details eight coastal paddle trails around Clarence suitable for beginners through to advanced kayakers in waterproof, tearproof brochure and uh, other information being available to them. This innovative world-class initiative is representative of all that is great about our city. Significant road projects completed this year include the Bayfield Street streetscape development in Rosney Park, including the commissioning of the Winkley Place Bayfield Street traffic lights. We have continued to work on our status as an age-friendly city with programs and facilities tailored towards inclusive spaces and connectedness continuing around Clarence, with more collaboration between our youth network and our uh, Clarence Positive Ageing Advisory Committee. Our shared spaces performances have been particularly highlighted of this relationship, serving to share the untold stories of ageing and living in a mixed community. Our enviable arts program is continuing to grow with a diverse program of arts and events in the city. Alongside the annual Jazz Festival, the popular Poochie Ball Art Prize, Clarence City Council once again participated in Dark Mofo with the Only the Penitent Shall Pass, a large-scale interactive sculpture exhibition held at the Rosny Barn. We also successfully trialled a new Christmas in Clarence program foregoing the large Belvery boardwalk carols and instead replacing them with a number of similar small-scale um, events around the city. In closing, I'd like to thank my colleagues, the fellow aldermen, uh, both those in the previous council and the ones that have arrived uh, around the council table since the last elections. I'd also like to acknowledge our, and thank our former long-serving general manager, Andrew Paul, for his many years of service to Clarence and welcome our new general manager and thank him and his staff for their hard work and commitment in working together <coughs> to deliver the services and innovative programs for the residents of Clarence. Uh, that concludes my uh, report. <coughs> I'd like to now invite the CFO to present the financial report. Uh, thank you. Miriam Coleman. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, can you hear me? Cool. Thank you, Mr Mayor and Alderman, for the opportunity to present Council's 2018-19 financial statements this evening. In general, I just wanted to make the following points. Our accounts were lodged within the 45-day uh, statutory time frame. The audit was undertaken by the office of the um, TAS Audit Office um, and also the Auditor General has issued an unqualified audit report for Council. I'd just like to run through um, some major policy changes and events that have affected our financial statements. First of all, um, Council is required to adopt um, Australian accounting standards 
And in the 18-19 financial <coughs> year, um, Council adopted AASB 9 financial instruments for the current annual reporting period. Uh, this uh, accounting standard replaced what was called AASB 139 and um, had no impact on previously reported figures as a result, as a result of the adoption. Also, um, the general, um, Valuer General's uh, fresh valuation also had an impact on Council's asset values. Um, and they were accounted for in relation to Council's own land and buildings. And this uh, resulted in an increase in the value of Council's owned land. Also for the year, um, our Council's park equipment was due for review. And we had a review of um, asset lives and they were um, amended accordingly. Also, in 2018, we had the creation um, of a new asset register as a result of a new financial system. And a decision was made at that time to defer the capitalisation of completed projects until the following year. Um, this approach was supported by the Office of the Auditor General. To that end, in 2018-19, um, a considerable amount of work was performed by council officers to uh, bring up to date um, the asset register and uh, we had over 31 million in additions to uh, council's asset register as a result of this work. Also, just to highlight that um, our funding received from the Grants Commission, uh, from time to time they do make a payment in advance and this is then reflected in the financial statements. So, uh, for 2019-2020, um, the Grants Commission has partially paid in advance to Council um, an approximate amount of 1.43 million. So, that's been recognised in the 18-19 financial year. Also, um, just a major highlight is that 2018-19 is the first year that TAS Water's 10-year capping of distribution to owners takes effect. You will see this represented as Council's dividend income inc uh, decreasing by $1.1 million since from the prior year. I'll move on to the income statement, which you'll find on page 54 of the annual report. Overall, the operating result um, was an accounting surplus of $14.651 million. I'm going to break that down into income and expenses. Uh, for income, our total recurrent income was pretty consistent with prior year and, of course, budget estimates. We had an $8 million contribution of assets to Council and um, for those who are not aware of what this may be, this is when um, subdivisions come online and those assets are handed over to Council and form part of our asset register. Also of note, um, the share of the net result of associates um, is significantly different from prior year. This year it's 1.54 million and last year it was $300,000. Uh, this is um, recognition of um, Council's involvement with, uh, with copying and the C cell. And uh, speaking to the CEO of those authorities, um, there has been a significant throughput of waste through their facilities. And of course, this has generated significant income of which we receive a share. Um, expenses for council were generally within budget. However, I would like to point out that budgeted depreciation does and will vary from accounting depreciation. Budgeted <coughs> depreciation talks about funding required. Uh, accounting depreciation is the, the magic of accounting standards. For Council, the underlying operating result, which is talked about in Note 37, is actually $4.4 million, and you'll find that on page 84. This measure actually represents the operating result of Council. So it's excluding things such as specific purpose, capital grants, and contributions of capital. So this is more reflective of Council's own operations without the additions of these um, other funds. I'd just like to note that um, Council has a 10-year long-term financial plan and this $4.4 million is slightly over what was projected for the plan for this particular financial year. Uh, the projection was three and we've res landed at 4.4. Also in the income statement, but a little bit further below, you will find that um, there's been a significant increase um, in Council's uh, value in TAS Water. 
Um, council holds a 10.46% share in the net assets of TAS Water, and TAS Water's net assets were reported at $1.859 billion. This increase goes through um, what is called other comprehensive income and is also spoken about in Note 12. Moving on to the balance sheet at page 55. Going through the items, um, there's been a slight increase in cash of $2.4 million. Now this is primarily di driven by the timing of income and expenditure, cash coming through, um, and of course the timing of um, capital expenditure as well. You will see there that the land valuation has increased uh, by approximately $19.6 million, and the majority of that was as a result of the Value of General's fresh valuation. I talked earlier about the work in progress, about the capitalisation. So in 2018, the balance was unusually high. Um, and with the work that's been done, you will now find it at much more normal levels. So you'll see that difference between that, uh, the two financial years. Uh, that is also talked about in Note 17. Investment in associates um, includes our investment in C-cell and copying. And um, they've made considerable improvements in their assets, which actually also then improves their balance sheet of which we receive a share and recognise on our balance sheet. I've already talked about the investment in the Water Corporation, but you will see that in the balance sheet quite clearly, the change in value <coughs> and council's share of their net assets. Other infrastructure assets were stable. I'd like to point out also <coughs> there is a non-current cash item which actually represented as a term deposit that um, has a three-year term, so um, we would classify that as non-current because it's not due in the next, in the immediate 12 months. Moving on to the cash flow statement at page 57. Um, overall, um, I don't have any great matters to highlight. Um, as I've already indicated, there was a change in the balance of cash by $2.4 million. However, with regards to um, cash for investment um, purposes, that is a little bit lower than prior year. And this is actually reflecting the timing of Capital <coughs> Works programming. You'll also note um, in note 13, I haven't got a page number, sorry, I apologise, is that of the cash balance, um, 40 million of that is actually restricted and it's um, restricted for to fund specific purpose um, uh, activities. I'm going to move on to financial ratios that we include in the financial statements. And these financial ratios are provided to us and are used as part of the Auditor General's um, measurement of performance of councils throughout the state. You'll find them on page 84. Our net financial liabilities ratio is very strong <coughs> and is consistent with past years. Our underlying surplus ratio, which I mentioned, um, I mentioned the $4.4 million in underlying surplus, the actual ratio remains strong and it remains consistent with our adopted 10-year plan. Our asset consumption ratios, stormwater and buildings are close to or above the benchmark. Our roads assets are slightly below the benchmark and this is a trend that continues but we are actively working towards improving. The asset renewal um, funding ratio is at 96%. This is an important indicator since it recognises the financial effort required versus the physical effort. Um, it demonstrates our financial <coughs> capability in terms of managing and maintaining our asset portfolio. The asset sustainability ratio is at 68% and is below benchmark. The ratio is below benchmark due to the timing of a major project, projects and in these projects less capital expenditure was actually allocated to renewal. So the focus for the year um, tended to be more on new assets as opposed to renewal, hence this is being reflected in the ratio. The Auditor General provides an audit completion report. And in his audit completion report, he noted th three things. First of all, he raised awareness for the appropriate management of excessive leave balances that are currently held. 
by council officers, and that is being actively managed by management, and also is um, part of is a, an awareness um, of the audit and risk panel. Also noted by the auditor general was the uh, completion of. Uh, the councillor-related party declarations. Uh, we needed a little, bit, a little bit more timely in that and um, management have taken note of that. And also just some improvements in system reporting as we bed down um, the new system. Um, our reporting also will improve with that as well and those are management action items that we've taken on board. Um, for future issues, I think it's um, something worth noting is just consideration of our cash, cash utilisation going forward and a lot of that will also be addressed as um, we work through uh, updating our 10 year long term financial plan in the six months. That's my report. Thank you, General Manager, I think you had uh, a couple of comments as well. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I had uh, two points to note. Um, on page 85 of the um, annual report uh, in the financial statements, uh, Alderman Blomley's name is misspelled um, and that will need to be corrected. Um, and on page 86, the uh, key management personnel table that was updated today uh, because of an oversight um, from our point of view, from my point of view, um, and that now reflects the uh, signed off audited financials from the Auditor General. There was no change in the numbers, it was a change in the layout and the detail. Um, and with, uh, with the um, consent of Council, I'd like to, uh, to note those amendments as part of the motion tonight. Thank you. Um, I moved Alderman Blomley. Do I have a second? Oh, after it's on the table, I'll, I'll give the opportunity for questions. Yeah, so, are you willing to second the? Yes, Thank you. So, moved all and long, seconded all uh, and James. Are there any questions or discussion points in regard to the annual report? All and James. Yeah. Uh, my question I have two in relation to the CFO um, <coughs> and perhaps through your uh, office, Mr. Mayor, um, that answer can be provided either now or in writing later. It's with regard to the Capital Works programming, um, is the CFO able to provide an estimate of carry forward Capital Works from the 1819 <coughs> financial year and will these projects be completed before uh, those projects that we endorsed uh, in the 1920 financial year? Yes. Well, are you able to provide an answer on that at this stage? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you very much for your question. I will need to get the carry forward capital works program in detail in the council's um, annual plan, which is on the website. Um, please forgive me if I get this, don't get this quite right. I believe it's approximately 21 million that's being carried forward into 1920. Any other questions in regard to the annual report? Um, also, my question through you, Mr Mayor, to the CFO, and that's on, in relation to page 83. And I, page 83, it refers to, amongst other things, that the due to the timing of receipt of these records, some data remains unaudited. And it refers to Alma's Activity Centre, the Lindisfarne Community Activities, the Clarence City Band. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, is, <coughs> um, is the CFO or the General Manager able to advise when those um, uh, special committees of council, um, their books will be audited and obviously we have some idea as to the state of the financial situation in relation to those six special committees. Thank you. Coleman? <coughs> Committees have been audited okay. and have all received a clear audit certificate. Thank you. Any 
have a discuss discussion or questions? I'll put the motion in that the annual report be received. All those in favour? Um, carried unanimously, and that's including the amendments that uh, were sought from the uh, general manager. Um, there are no reports at item seven, and there are no motions on notice at item eight. We do have a question on notice from Mr D Griggs at item nine. General Manager. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, we actually have three questions from Mr Griggs. I'll read the question out and then the answer, and uh, these responses will be provided in writing to Mr Griggs uh, in the next few days. First question is, in the 2018-19 council budget money was set aside for an upgrading of Risdon Vale Oval surroundings and buildings. Since that time, no work has been done. When will this work commence and what is happening to the money set aside for this project? The answer is, uh, council has adopted a number of projects to be undertaken at the Risdon Vale Oval. Funds have been maintained in the budget for the following works. Recent new irrigation has been installed in the Oval. Next week, work will commence on installing new subsoil drainage. In the coming weekend, a tender will be advertised for the new club rooms, sorry, change rooms and toilet facility. This is anticipated to go to the February 2020 council meeting for awarding. Currently, consultants are completing the design to tender in 2020 for Oval lighting and planning work has commenced on new ball catching nets. Those are the works that are, are planned and, and scheduled. The second question is, can a system be put in place when a complaint or query is made so that a reference number is given to the person doing this so that a person only has to quote this when following up an issue with council? The answer to the question is that following the deployment of our new property and rating system this year, Council is currently looking at ways to improve tracking issues. We've uh, taken this suggestion from Mr Griggs on board and uh, we'll endeavour to factor that into the way that, uh, that uh, issues and complaints are tracked. The third question is, can senior management please reinforce with staff within to, sorry, to respond to rate payer issues within time frames as in customer service charter and to return phone calls when messages are left. The issue has been getting worse over the last six to nine months. And the answer is this has been reinforced as part of the recently reviewed and approved council customer service charter. We're aware of these issues and are addressing them as a priority and as part of our uh, upgrades to and refinement of our new computer system, um, we are currently working on, uh, in particular, the 10-day time frame for responses so that that becomes, uh, comes back within specification. Thank you. Thank you. Item 10, uh, questions without notice. Are there any questions without notice for this annual general meeting? In that case, uh, that brings us to the close of the annual general meeting, which I declare formally closed, and now declare officially open the council meeting. Um, and item one is apologies, Alderman Chong. <coughs> item two is confirmation <coughs> of minutes for the 11th of November as circulated be taken as read and confirmed. Alderman Blomley, second to Alderman Piers. Thank you. Any uh, issues in regard to the previous minutes? In that case, all those in favour? Carried unanimously. Mayor's communication, uh, I will um, table a, uh, a list of appointments that I've uh, been involved with over the last uh, three weeks since the last council meeting and that will appear in the minutes. Um, I will uh, point out that um, last week we attended a, a workshop of the Greater Hobart Act uh, principles, namely the four mayors and uh, minister, uh, the two ministers, Minister State Growth and uh, also Minister Jantz. Um, we workshopped where we might be going with the Greater Hobart Act and the priorities. I think it's important to point out it's a separate process to the arrangements under the, uh, the Greater Hobart City Deal. 
Um, but the most important um, priority will be to develop a uh, higher level strategic plan for Greater Hobart. The notes for that meeting aren't out yet, but I will circulate those to Alderman as soon as I have them available. Uh, moving on to item four, that Council notes the workshops conducted on the 18th and 25th of November and the agenda brief on the 29th of November. Thank you, Alderman Kennedy. Uh, second, Alderman Newington. Any questions there? I'll oh, put the motion. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Item five, declarations of interest of Alderman or close associate, Alderman James. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I would like to declare an interest on item 11.3.1. That's development application at 21 Rywina Road. I have an office in that building and I will be absent, obviously, in discussion in relation to that item. Thanks, uh, Any other conflicts of interest? Thank you. Item six is tabling of petitions. There are none on the agenda. Any uh, aldermen wish to table a position? Uh, petition. Thank you. Item seven is public question time. 7.1, uh, there's an answer to a question on notice from John Council, General Manager. Um, thank you. Um, Mayor, um, Mr Council asked uh, the following question. In approximately March 2018, a rubbish bin was installed by Council at the Lookout Car Park in Rosney Hill Nature Recreation Area. This bin is often full to overflowing. When will Council install a recycling bin next to the rubbish bin, which is the usual practice throughout the city? Uh, the answer is a recycling bin will be installed next to the existing bin before the end of 2019. Thank you. Item 7.3, there's a uh, response to a question on notice from Mrs Marsh, which I intend to take as read. 7.4, um, questions with an out notice uh, from members of the public, if there are any. Thank you. Moving on to item eight, deputations by members of the public. General Manager. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, our first uh, deputation <coughs> is from Mr Todd Leal in relation to um, development application SD 2019-10, 20 Regal Court. Mr Leal, as you come forward, I remind all speakers that there's only an opportunity for three minutes and there'll be a tone at two and a half minutes to give you a chance to wind up. So do I get to someone say go? <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll start timing when you start. Okay. All right, my name's Todd Leal and I live at Lewis Avenue, Seven Mile Beach. Um, this is in regards to the DA at Regal Court, Seven Mile Beach. So now, in regards to the traffic impact assessment report, there are no vehicle movement assessments done at the proposed intersection. Um, there's inaccurate methodology used for the timing of the traffic activity. The peak hours used were 8 to 9 a.m. and 4.30 to 5.30 p.m., whereas peak hours are generally 7.30 to 9 and 4.30 to 6, with no consideration given to school times or summer, where traffic increases greatly from outside users to the beach. There's also inaccurate methodology used for the total vehicle movements. It is based on 47 dwellings, which is an expected outcome. As the state planning scheme provisions are not in effect yet, the multiple dwellings could currently be approved. Um, there's no pedestrian crossing assessment done at the proposed intersection. From the traffic impact assess assessment, and I quote, therefore the design of the intersection needs to be considered only in terms of the safe movement of vehicles through the intersection. The above quote is based on the assumption that this is intersection has fully formed and safe footpaths. This is definitely not the case currently or proposed. The only access point to cross is a 50 metre walk on the road. You actually have to walk on the road um, to get to the only formed footpath and this is currently dangerous. There is no consideration given to safe movement of pedestrians, wheelchairs, prams or kids on bikes through the intersection. The walk and cycle path from this subdivision aggresses to the right hand side of Lewis Avenue heading southeast where there is no formed footpath further exacerbating the unsafe aspect of this subdivision. The proposed four leg intersection does not meet Australian safety design in regards to pedestrian crossing, reference Ostroad's guide to road design part 6A, paths for walking and cycling. This feeds through into the assessment of performance criteria. I could give you at least three examples of conflicting statements, although time is of the essence. 
um, inundation, the geotechnical assessment report, there are mistakes in regards to the depth references of the test holes. There's no result discussions for the 16 test holes dug in regards to the ele sorry, dug or in regards to the elevated E. coli detected in the SMB aquifer. Um, assessment for proposed subdivision engineers report. There's incorrect coastal measurements quoted. Um, the three hours storm is used as the basis for the estimated time of concentration for the worst case flooding of the watercourse. There's no quantifying rain measurement used, i.e. 50 mil, 100 mil, so you're unable to reference previous storm events. This is inadequate. So basically in conclusion, it appears that not only that there are mistakes within the proponent supplied reports, under assessment is also evident. From what has been presented to Council, there's also referencing errors, misrepresentation of the 5.0 representation issues, and again, all right, sorry. And again, examples could be given leading to further reports being necessary, but time does not allow for this. From the original advertisement, there was information missing. So I would say that overall this DA has been rushed, which is indicative of the many mistakes and together with the under assessments and the lack of vital information being missed, um, or sorry, needed to facilitate a fully informed decision to be made. Now, there's a solution for this application, or, although the time doesn't allow me for this expansion. So. It's not an auditorium where we're here for the entertainment or whatever. I know some people feel really strongly about this issue on both sides of the fence. Please respect the chamber and the requirement for us to be able to debate the issues uh, without fear or favour. So please respect that. Um, our second uh, deputation tonight is uh, Mr Marcel Castile in relation to the proposed Cleve Court track. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Alderman, and everyone that's present uh, for the opportunity to give this dip deputation on a matter uh, that affects the Cleve Court residents in Hara. My name is Marcel Castile. I live in Cleve Court. I've lived there for about five years. I live there with my family, and I really enjoy the lifestyle that the uh, Clarence Council offers us. Um, <coughs> we received a letter on the 9th of August that we were going to, there was a proposed track to be built along the foreshore for about 300 metres and go through an alleyway um, which is only about 1.8 metres wide and be part of the uh, track and trail scheme. And it was going to be a class two shared path. Now the alleyway is 1.8 metres long. So in all we had some um, quite severe concerns in regards to the appropriateness of the shared path in front of our properties and along the alleyway and what the effects it would have on, on the residents, adjoining re residents. Part of our concern is that we don't think that sufficient consultation has been carried out or an assessment made. So we made this aware in the letter that we uh, tabled with a petition about two <coughs> residents and um, we have had meetings with some of the aldermen and the officers as well. Now, some of the concerns are that if the track goes ahead, um, there will be more parking in the street. It's only a congested cold sack already. It will interfere with emergency trucks. Um, there will be some adverse effects as well on um, drainage of the houses because it will actually dam some of the flat land uh, which drains into the river at the moment. And I think all the aldermen are aware of the concerns that we've got. Um, and thank you for the aldermen coming to site to discuss this with us. Um, so it's based, the track is based on the plan, uh, 2020 or 2018, 2020 plan. We've got some concerns about how the proposal has been approved. Um, <coughs> it is mentioned in this track that um, it, it is up upgraded to a priority track. Also in this plan I might note that some community members, which wasn't asked because I uh, still maintain we haven't been informed, do like that for sure to be maintained as grass because some people enjoy walking on grass. Anyway, the recommendation was to adopt this plan and um, again under adopting it, the recommendations under which the plan was adopted does not specify this section of track in the recommendation in the minutes. When this plan has been uh, approved, yeah, that's right, um, we, we put on another petition 
That petition has got some elements in it, which has been uh, provided a report upon by the council. Now, that report only um, responds to a few of our concerns. I know there's a vote on it or on the recommendation, but I feel that the residents believe that the council cannot make a fully informed decision on this report as it's incomplete. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the time. Um, I have a third deputation tonight uh, from Mr Andrew Lyden in respect to One Hill Estate. I'm not sure if Mr Lyden is here. No. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item 9, 9.1, <coughs> notices of motion, Alderman Mulder. Uh, I won't be proceeding with that motion. Um, right, moving on to item 10. Uh, 10.1, <coughs> the uh, reports from single and joint authorities. Copying refuse disposal site joint authority, Alderman Walker, have you got a report to make? Uh, just a verbal, the AGM was held last week and uh, yeah, minutes etc will we'll follow from that. That was indeed a, a good year for the authority. Come. In regard to Taswater, um, I'd like to table first of all the annual report. Uh, and the quarterly report to the end of September and also the uh, minutes from the owners representative group meeting that was held a couple of weeks ago up in Launceston. Thank you. Thank you. And under the Greater Hobart Committee um, dealing, there's nothing to report in regard to the city deal. Reports 10.2, reports from Council and Special Committees and other representative bodies. There's three in the agenda starting with the Bicycle Advisory Committee. Uh, moved Alderman Newington, second Alderman Kennedy. Uh, do you wish oh, to speak to the motion? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Oh, just to um, say that you know, there's obviously a lot of um, work going into the, uh, the bicycle and the community side of things. I think you know, we have uh, recognition of the uh, you know, big role that it plays in, the, in one of the Council's key tasks, and uh, it's pleasing to see that. Uh, a lot of things are happening out there in that space, and I'll take this opportunity to say the same sort of thing in the tracks and trails, and also in uh, all the Florida's area of the, um, you know, the natural uh, environment and the, the parks and things that are going there. So I think we've, we've got a lot going on, and it's great to see it all, uh, all happen. Thank you. Uh, other speakers? So the recommendation is that chairperson's report be received by council. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Secondly, the tracks and trails advisory committee, Alderman Newington. Seconder, Alderman Blomley. Speaker to this uh, as well. Yes. Other speakers? Put the motion. All those in favour? <coughs> Carried unanimously. NRM and Grants Committee. Alderman Warren, thank you. Second up. Alderman Kennedy. Uh, do you wish to speak to the motion? I'm just commend the report to Council. Um, it's one of the most readable reports, has the best photos, and thanks to Justin and Chris and all the Council officers who do so much work in this area. Thank you. Any other speakers? The motion is that the chairperson's report be received. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Are there any other reports? Alderman Mulder. Mr. I uh, table the um, annual general uh, meeting minutes of the uh, Power Community Centre and also uh, the President's report. Can you speak briefly to those? Um, the uh, committee uh, of um, Mr. Michael Gear, Stephen Foster, John Baskick and Cheryl Wilson, Roger Viney, uh, representing the Sunshine Tennis Club, the Harrow Bowls Club, the Harrow Men's Shed and Guides Tasmania. Um, and Mr Viney was uh, elected uh, chair and uh, president of that, um, or chairman of that uh, particular committee. Now the, um, the, the committee is uh, operating a very viable and um, well, uh, shall I say, attended uh, facility of this council and it serves uh, basically the large area of, uh, of Howrah and, uh, and the areas in the surrounds. The only issue of uh, challenging issue that the President comes up with, which I think is uh, worth, uh, with, is worth um, actually um, pursuing in here, and I'll just quote the report because uh, the one issue challenging the Centre and in turn Council is the peculiar financial arrangements the Centre is based upon and is required to follow. The system is outdated, which basically renders the volunteers working no chance of ever getting any cash flow above outgoings. The concern is that to motivate a quality volunteer base who wish to make themselves available, 
giving up their valuable time and work towards a continual enhancement, as one of them said, to, uh, of the council, will be challenging in the future. I think this is an issue that uh, council senior management needs to address with some urgency, and, uh, and I can report that there have been some discussions around this particular issue. But it's worth noting that this is not the only centre that has this difficulty that operating as a committee of council, staff of council employees, must be paid at the council award rate, which is different to the normal commercial rate uh, for some of the facilities that goes out there. And it really is a grapple, because these things will just simply fall over if these volunteers are spending all their time worrying about cash flows and monies when they ought to be out there uh, improving the facility and services for the various clubs and committees that are so well serviced by, this, uh, by the Harrow Community Centre. So uh, we can leave the meeting, Mr Mayor, I'll table those reports. Other reports? Yes. Uh, Councillor Lee. Thank you. So uh, moving on to 11.1, uh, weekly briefing reports. That the information contained in the weekly briefing reports of the 11th, 18th and 25th of November be noted. Thanks, Alderman Bromley, seconded Alderman Edmonds. Any questions on the weekly briefing reports? Put the motion then. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Uh, 11.2.1 .1 is a petition in regard to Cleve Court foreshore track. Alderman Edmonds. Um, in light of the deputation, I would like to move that we delay this to the next meeting based on the fact that the deputation talks about incomplete information rather than contesting facts. Um, I think we should buy ourselves some more time to work with the petition to cover the petitioners to cover off the outstanding issues. Um, well, I'll take that as a procedural motion if there, that it be deferred uh, pending a workshop, was it? Or to cover off the concerns that raised about the incomplete. That it be deferred to cover off concerns raised. Okay. Is there a seconder for that, please? I'll Thanks, Alderman James. Sorry. Uh, being procedural, there's no debate. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Against? The motion is carried. Uh, now advise the council intends to sit as a planning authority under the Land Use Planning and Approvals Act. Uh, Alderman James. Thank you. Item eleven point three point one is a development application at fifty seven Montague Bay Road, two multiple dwellings. Alderman Mulder, thank you. Do we have a seconder, please? Alderman Newington. Alderman Mulder. The officer's recommendation is... Thank you. Other speakers? I put the recommendation for approval subject to conditions and advice. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Would we recall Alderman James, please? Item 11.3.2 is a subdivision application at 20 Regal Court, 7 Mile Beach for a 49 lot subdivision. Alderman James. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I have circulated a, uh, an alternative motion and that was circulated uh, early this morning and also later this afternoon. Do we have a second, uh, Alderman Kennedy? Thank you. Uh, uh, Alderman James. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. Look. Um, just a couple of things. Firstly, um, there has been an, a, an addition to this um, uh, motion, and that is that Alderman von Berto has requested, and I think it's appropriate it ought to be included, an additional reason for refusal, and that is dot point three under reasons for refusal, that due to various current and projected geotechnical flora, fauna, traffic, social and sporting recreation facilities and the stormwater drainage inundation issues, a long-term <coughs> structure plan for the Seven Mile Beach Township should be developed to guide the delivery of a quality urban environmental uh, environment before any further residential development is approved. And also, Mr Mayor, under my, the, um, 
the motion that I have for the chair uh, under dot point one under one two three four five inclusive. It should be performance criteria sixteen point five point two p one. I've actually <laughs> included the acceptable solution notation where it should be the uh, performance criteria. So it should be p one in in lieu of a one in each of those uh, subjects. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, I do seek to have those changes incorporated if the seconder is happy to agree to them. So, can you just do that again in a slower time, please? Yes, the, uh, on the, the handout, yeah. uh, under the one, two, three, four, and five dot points, sure. it should be uh, performance criteria 16.5.2, P1, and then under two, it should be P1 and P1 for each of those questions uh, in relation to those sections. And also the um, addition to the reasons for refusal is what I have just read out, and that is the dot point three under reasons for refusal. And that was from Northern Bank. That's right, out. and that okay. has been circulated. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, uh, this is an important issue, and. Uh, and as we go through this particular process, you can see that the proposal is contrary to the village zone and also the performance criteria in that there will be additional traffic volumes generated within the proposed subdivision. And this will impact on the different or various uh, subdivision road intersections that may be uh, part and parcel of the, the development and that includes outside the actual, uh, de uh, outside the actual uh, proposal or the uh, development. The second matter is in relation to the inundation prone areas code and any future development of the lots will result in a higher total quantity and rate of su um, surface runoff coupled with service runoff problems and which is also prevalent at the moment with, uh, at this point in time in low-lying areas of Seven Mile Beach. The council has spent a lot of money over the years uh, initiating uh, drainage pits on the different road networks and also in many uh, instances there has been flooding within the uh, areas of, um, of Seven Mile Beach and uh, the council has been called out on a number of occasions <coughs> to assist and to obviously pump from those properties uh, amount of excess water that has has actually pooled in those areas. Uh, item three, the proposal is contrary to the waterway and coastal protection code and performance criteria as listed, as it will require widening a section of the watercourse and creation of a drainage easement that will need and will result in runoff generated by the development that will significantly impact on the natural in, uh, values of the area. And this, as I mentioned earlier in the pre preceding uh, uh, point two, there have been uh, problems with runoff uh, in relation and also water pooling within Seven Mile Beach, and this uh, extension has, is part and parcel of it. Uh, may I say at this point, Mr Mayor, that when we are determining any application or uh, for any permit, then we need to consider uh, three, uh, two factors. Firstly, all applicable standards and requirements in this planning scheme need to be considered. And if there are concerns, and if they are exempt, they, sorry, if they're seeking exemption, then in fact, those listed that on this particular uh, off, um, motion has been identified under these uh, five, five headings. Also, all apl applicable standards and requirements in this planning scheme and any representations received pursuant to this. James. I seek council support. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Kennedy, a seconder. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and I apologise in advance for my voice. I'd like to thank Todd Leal for his insightful and very well researched deputation. <coughs> when I was elected to council a year ago, I promised that I'd listen to our ratepayers, and that's who I'm representing tonight. We've received 67 representations regarding the, this DA, plus many additional communications to all aldermen from concerned residents. 
There's a lot of concern, this is a lot of concern for a very small village. And in my short time on council, we've heard very little from this village. They're concerned about <coughs> some serious issues. Serious issues that they'll be left to deal with, in particular if access to this development is via Lewis Avenue, safety being number one. This village, as identified earlier, is one with very few footpaths. There are none with even surfaces. People make do, mothers with prams, kids on bikes, those needing mobility scooters, all trying to navigate their way to the shop, our one shop, or and the beach. And that's how it is right now. The traffic impact assessment, as identified by Mr Leal, is not an accurate indication of the true situation. It actually mentions two bus movements per day. That's, there's like 10 to 12 minimum. The traffic has increased dramatically since Gruber Avenue opened. There's existing issues that have been raised with Woodhurst Avenue right now, and that's right opposite the proposed development access. It also, uh, just to me, seems quite ludicrous to travel right around the entire village to gain access when there is an existing road already <coughs> servicing residences at the start of Seven Mile Beach. Um, I think a number of aldermen received a report, um, an engineer's report dated 18th of May, supporting the one access to the whole site of Seven Mile Beach Road via the current golf course entrance, which is Regal Court. I also have some concerns about inundation um, and there's nothing here that really gives me comfort that this is not going to become a problem in the future. Now on most <coughs> days, there, at, currently there's anywhere between 50 and 100 cars from outside the village accessing the golf course. That's just about every day. And they do this very comfortably, just quietly slipping down Regal Court. The village right now is only just coping with the big increase in traffic since Gruber Avenue opened. As I mentioned earlier, pushing the traffic associated with almost 50 blocks right through the heart of the village and connecting with yet another trouble spot in Woodhurst Road is going to be simply dangerous for the people living and trying to make their way around this area. I cannot support this motion. Thank you. Actually, I do support this motion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> Alderman Walker. Uh, I'm going to listen to the rest of the debate with, with a fair bit of interest. Uh, here's, the, here's the situation. We have had lots of representations and the representations that we receive is something that does have to be taken into account when we make our decisions. These representations have been over really good quality. Uh, there's been perhaps one representation that was just, no, no, not a bar of it. The rest of the representations have tended to take a similar track along the, the lines of um, <coughs> traffic, traffic and traffic. And I think for most of us this is the issue that, uh, that is, is probably focusing our minds as we, as we debate this. Um, just while thinking about it, a question through you to Mr Lovell. Uh, in the representations, that, well, in the deputation tonight, there was uh, some concern around the fact that multiple dwellings could be currently built uh, on this site. Is that something that is actually possible under the current uh, scheme? Mr Mayor, um, we refer to that on page 89, and where we say that multiple dwellings are allowable in the village zone. However, the proposed state of planning provisions um, uh, won't allow it. Um, but we also say that notwithstanding that, um, um, the road net, oh, well, it's even in debate. And what I would say is that the roads aren't possible in the village zone um, for the time being. So at the moment, not, but we're just talking about the proposed scheme won't permit it, but in, right as we sit in the moment, in the interim, you're, you're, you're reinforcing that it's not something that would be permitted. Okay. Um, so this is, uh, you know, as issues come before us, this is probably one of the more significant ones that have come before us this year um, that require a bit of focus. And I've got to express a bit of disappointment that as far as an alternate, getting it late today is, is not a really good way to go. 
I, uh, I can back the refusal points one and four that are specifying around traffic with comfort. I think there is merit and integrity around that. I am concerned with the other points that are basically citing reasons that there should be uh, a stop to, to any, any development or, or, or consideration of development on this site. Uh, I believe that most people in the area think that the, the most rational solution is around <coughs> egress and, 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 and entrance, which is to do with the fact that Regal Court, even though it's the, the, the name that comes before us in the application, isn't the actual area that, that, that uh, these blocks will be serviced from. And I haven't seen evidence that there's been a lot of investigation about making this happen. There's been some cursory remarks around uh, the current width and you know needing to perhaps liaise with council uh, around you know perhaps some acquisition of land, be it public and private. And yet I haven't actually seen evidence that any of that's occurred. Um, so for me, this will fall down to uh, largely around traffic. And I think I might be in a bit of a dilemma. Though I'll hear what the the rest of the debate say, I might be in a dilemma of potentially opposing this motion but foreshadowing one that's pretty much just points one and four on traffic because I, I, I'm concerned that what's been put here is is issues that, that are not necessarily what I would agree as, as reasons for referral. But again, this has come before my email inbox at I think around 4.30 or something tonight with very limited time to sort of talk these issues through. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Mayor. At first, when I first heard about this development, I thought, no worries, approve a subdivision like we normally would. And uh, I did have the pleasure of going down to Seven Mile Beach and met with residents, met with, uh, with, along with Alderman Edmonds and Alderman Kennedy. And I've got to admit, I totally support the recommendation before the Chamber, which I've got to admit even surprised me. But once you go down there, you do see the issues that very much are in this motion, I'm afraid to say. And traffic is a major one, there's no risk. It does make me a little bit nervous when we're gonna alter a water course too that has to be widened. So I just get a little bit nervous when you start doing things like this. Because to me, it was absolute no brainer that the traffic issue should have been on uh, Regal Court. I just cannot understand why you'll put traffic out into a small road where it is going according to these plans. To me, that's utter stupidity. Now, Mr Lovell, tell me if I'm wrong. Regal Court Council owns some land. It will probably say yes if the developer came and said, look, we want to take some of that council I, land. I, I don't think it's appropriate to ask uh, Mr Lovell. Well, I'm saying it's a possible. I, I don't think it's uh, appropriate to ask Mr Lovell whether or not council is about to release some land. No, but it is council land, so it's more than likely that we You can hypothesise, but I think it's yes. unfair to put well, it on the council. Well, I would say that we probably would. So to me, I just cannot see for the life of me why a subdivision here, and I understand, I've only been told, I don't know if it's true, but a previous application was going to be put through, and the entrance was to be at Regal Court. Now, to me, that is common sense. That is where it should be. Straight on to, to Seven Mile Beach Road and away. Not, not this way. To me, I've got to be honest, I, I'm very disappointed with that in a small village area as such. Other speakers? Alderman Moulton and then Alderman Newington. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I don't intend to address all of the points uh, raised in the um, excellent. Uh, um, alternative motions that have been put forward, or the alternative motion that we're debating now, plus the, um, the thing. I want to focus on the storm water and inundation issues. We have an engineering report that tells us that uh, a one in a hundred year uh, flood event occurs uh, because of a three hour duration storm. If climate change tells us anything, and our own knowledge and our own experience in the last decade tells us anything, these severe weather events are going to become more frequent and they're going to become more intense. So all the planning around getting rid of the stormwater as a result of, um, of projected one in a hundred year flood events, I think is, uh, is, is very risky. We also have the, uh, the question of sea level rise. Um, and that requires, a, um, you know, and, and, and to, to deal with that um, and the increased inundation. I might also say that in other areas of inundation, it's only stormwater that's in there 
and inundation occurs when the aquifer fills and, uh, and of course it's got nowhere to run. So um, what the situation with this is, is that um, here we have, not only is it stormwater, but the aquifer is pretty well replenished day in, day out by the fact that the stormwater, the sewerage water is uh, from septics and from uh, treat sewerage treatment plants as proposed for this area, are all there. So the, the aquifer is already at elevated levels compared to that which would happen if the rain just fell and it, it intermittently. So the aquifer isn't much of a buffer down there and it's not likely to be so in the future. Later on in the meeting we'll be discussing council stormwater strategy. And, um, and I asked him a few questions about, we don't have one yet, but um, apparently there's this thing called the um, state stormwater strategy. It identifies targets implemented through the planning scheme with stormwater detention systems required for uh, certain size projects. I would like to think that here is an area where detention is required because it's an area that's already subject to inundation and that's only going to get worse as climate change suggests. There are other areas that are also involved, Seven Mile Beach, Lauderdale, even Luttrell Avenue in Seven Mile Beach, which are going to require treatments down the track, which are including detaining that stormwater and then pumping it out uh, uh, when, um, when the, um, you know, instead of leaving it trapped behind and waiting for it to leak through the aquifer. In our stormwater strategy, there's, um, there's a uh, discussion around Catchment hydraulics in some areas may be impacted by sea level rise, including the impact of sea level rise outfalls. <coughs> and what the suggested potential improvements are, are um, continued awareness of this issue and reduction of greenhouse gases. Council officers are currently preparing an energy strategy which aims to reduce emissions from council buildings. And that uh, consider the impact of increased sea level rise on all new outfalls and include provision for this in the future stormwater strategy. Can I suggest that we should have learnt the lesson from Woodhurst Avenue and perhaps have built in these detention systems and pump out systems before we got to here? So for this, if, if for no other reason alone, and the other reasons are quite valid, I am prepared to, um, to, uh, to vote for this alternative recommendation. And it also doesn't mean that if you vote for this recommendation you have to agree to all of the points. Um, I mean, you know, they will all be assessed on their merits, should it come up to a uh, appeal. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, look, I have, you know, in this sort of situation where there's change happening in any community, look, I have, you know, everyone has a right to stand up and say whether they like it or don't like it. And obviously, we've, as we know, we've received plenty of representation from people saying that they are not too happy with it. Uh, but I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that would either be 50-50 or, or happy to see something go ahead. Um, and they're the ones we don't hear from too, and I think you know, we need to consider that as well. Um, you know, I understand that um, you know, people want to live near beaches these days. And I mean, um, you know, for the people that have gradually been added to Seven Mile, I mean, you know, they've been more than happy to go down there. And I, I know there's concerns and, and there's some legitimate things in, in the, uh, the alternative motion put forward here that may need to be addressed, but at the same time too, I mean, any person who has to go through the planning process to get approval to do something of this scale, uh, or even someone who just tries to put a shed in their backyard, would understand that it's a quite an extensive process and involves a lot of hoops to jump through and a lot of work to actually get to the point where you're actual, uh, able to actually do something. Now, the fact that this proposal has been assessed by council staff um, under the existing planning scheme, and has been uh, recommended for approval, suggests to me that uh, they've, they've covered most of the tasks and if there was something that was that bad in, in, the, uh, in the development that would require it to, uh, to be knocked back, I'm sure they would have brought it to our attention. Um, I mean, some of the issues that are raised there in relation to dealing with inundation or dealing with um, stormwater or dealing with traffic and all those sort of things, you know, that would require the upgrade of some of the the roads and the footpaths and, and some of those sorts of things and from my understanding of and obviously being only on council for 12 months but really um, you know some concerns when trees have tried to be removed and, and the the acts that went ahead with you know different opinions within the community of people wanted to stay exactly the same and some people wanted to be some trees cut down someone wanted footpaths some people didn't so um, you know trying to keep everyone happy is a very hard task and, and you know while 
40 extra blocks might seem like a huge increase in traffic. Um, you know, it may not be, it might not be as bad, as, but people are always going to think on the, on the, the worst side of it all. Um, you know, and I mean, and the real concern I have, if this is all lumped together, is Alderman Von Birdo's um, addition there to say, uh, you know, master planning's great, and I've certainly supported it in a lot of situations, but just to add a, a, a phrase in there that says we're going to, before we allow any further residential development, how long is it going to take to do a master plan? What's the added cost that's going to be added to everything? And does that mean that the whole place is shut down and the rate revenue that might actually allow us to complete some of these tasks to improve some of the infrastructure and things that might help the community are going to be not available in the short term or even maybe the long term. So um, I, I won't be supporting the, um, the recommendation to knock it back. As I said, I think if people have gone, you know, if, if there was a chance to look at alternative access, I'd certainly be willing to look at that as, as an alternative. But to knock it back and say no, um, after they've gone through all the hoops <coughs> and, and met all the requirements of the, uh, the planning scheme and dealt with council staff to get this point, um, you know, I'd only be happy to support support that. Um, but you know, I can't support this motion uh, in light of all those issues. Thank you. I'd reply. Oh, I was. Uh, sorry, Alderman Edmonds. We were just hedging over who was going to. I didn't want to push in. Um, very, very briefly. You know, I hate the idea of knocking off a um, 49 block subdivision. I think, you know, we've got a lot going for us as a city. People want to live here. We've got a variety of places people can live, whether it is at the beach or in town or in between suburbs where we're filling in the gaps. Um, I'm a bit of a similar mind to Alderman Walker, where I think a lot of the water stuff can be manageable or conditioned, but the traffic really bothers me. And I think for the simple, uh, or relatively simple task of, of using a different entrance. We take so many cars off the road that we'll be using a road that will deteriorate very quickly and then we'll be on the hook for the millions of dollars to fix that, plus the raised expectations of these 49 new dwellings. So in that sense, I think if we could... Uh, I am of a similar mind to Alderman Walker where I would support a motion that was just mo uh, points one and four. But... Um, yeah, I think the traffic needs to be looked at before this can go ahead. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Mr Mayor, I actually have a long association with Seven Mile Beach. Uh, I went there when I was one and I lived there until I was 21 and my parents owned the general store. So I know Seven Mile Beach well. I came onto council in 2007 and Pretty soon after I came onto council, the development on the right hand side of the road going into Seven Mile Beach started to occur. From that point I've had grave concerns in relation to the issues around groundwater, in relation to inundation, in relation to sea level rise as far as climate change is concerned. And it's particularly apparent in that particular area. When I first came on to council, it was a very dry time and many of the aldermen believed that there weren't going to be any issues with groundwater, inundation, etc. because we were in a dry time and that dry time was going to continue. The things changed quite considerably in 2009 and 2011 when we had to quote William Cromer in his report which was provided to council, the highest rainfall that we've had in well over 35 years. As we know with climate change it's expected that the climate will vary considerably and that as Mr Cromer says, it's likely, perhaps almost certain, that flood events will, will recur. And in the long term, the frequency and severity of flooding will increase if sea level rises, since this will unavoidably raise the water table in the township and the golf club. I actually believe that there are a number of issues in Seven Mile Beach that are coming together to 
make it that we really should look at a structure plan. Rather similar to the Tranmere Ropeby Peninsula structure plan that we're working on at the present time. I believe that we actually need to have technical reports done in relation to the geotechnical risk analysis, flora and fauna, traffic, and I think it's really important that we actually look at the aspects related to the social and sporting and recreational facilities and how all of these actually come together in an area. In relation to a structure plan, it's about having a vision, uh, perhaps a 10 to 20 year vision, in relation to the quality of the urban environment so that everyone who is dealing with that area <coughs> is on the same wavelength. It actually sets the scene for planning scheme amendments, which is very apparent that we need in this particular area. I disagree with some of the aldermen who have actually said that they believe the issues in relation to groundwater inundation, etc., can be conditioned. I don't believe that. I actually think that we need to have Mr Cromer do some further reports looking at the two subdivisions that we are looking at, or the two developments that we are looking at on both sides of the Seven Mile Beach Road. So I think it is very timely that we actually have a structure plan before we have any further development. Thank you. I reply on the uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, I'll be brief. Um, on page 72, uh, in determining any application, then that application must, uh, in addition to the matters under section 51.2 of the Act, take into consideration all applicable standards and requirements in the planning scheme. And in the officer's report, he says, um, amongst other things, that those acceptable solutions in the village zone, waterways, etc., um, are there, and there are exceptions to that. And I have listed those. They are the exceptions that have been identified under the uh, five points that have been shown, uh, have been tabled as part of this motion. The second item in relation to assessing an application is that any representations received pursuant to this particular section of the Act. Now, the number of rep representations, and I'm sure everybody who has had any dealings with those representatives, is a very high standard and a good cross-section of the community, which represent many of the concerns that not only certain people have, but there is a good cross-section of the community that have real concerns about this, and that has been addressed and forwarded in those um, uh, emails to us. In summary, Mr Mayor, may I say that the proposal will generate significant traffic volumes and high trip generation rates impacting upon the management of Council's road intersections than will impact on a small coastal and a village zone in Seven Mile Beach. Secondly, Clarence Council has not adopted a stormwater and or mitigation strategy for Seven Mile Beach, and that's already been identified in the consultant's report. It hasn't had uh, adopted that, uh, and that, by the very nature, has resulted, and I believe it's appropriate to say, has resulted in an estimated increase in stormwater runoff and impact that this proposal will have should it be uh, proceeded with. And finally, I think it's due, and there's a long-term uh, process that should be looked at uh, as part of a long-term uh, structure plan for Seven Mile Beach Township, and that should be developed in accordance with a number of these concerns that have not only been raised by a number of speakers here tonight, Mr Mayor, but also by 67 representatives who I believe represent the whole of the community at Seven Mile Beach. I seek council support. Thank you. So the motion before the chair is uh, the refusal moved by Alderman James with some slight amendments and Alderman von Goethe's additional reason for a refusal. All those in favour? Against? The motion is uh, carried. And um, 
That takes us to the next item on the agenda, which is 11.3.3, amendment application 110 Saltwater Rise, 68 and 72 Semi Beach Road, and 11 Coastal Drive, Semi Beach. Um, just as a point of procedure here, um, Mr Lovell's just advised me that uh, the applicants have requested that this um, this matter be uh, deferred uh, to seek further advice in regard to the urban growth boundary. Is that moved, Second Alderman Blum? Seconded, Alderman Pearce. Uh, it being procedural, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Carried unanimously, so that matter is deferred. And that concludes our business as a planning authority. Moving on to asset management, item 11.5.1, East Doon Highway duplication. Uh, Alderman Walker, thank yes. you. Second, please. Uh, Alderman Newington. Alderman Walker. Uh, yes, uh, certainly a priority uh, issue uh, has been identified for some time, and uh, this is, I guess, uh, whilst the ball started rolling a little over two years ago when funding was uh, obtained to do a uh, traffic study and um, some very elementary planning, um, we're now at a point where uh, there's a more fleshed out uh, document before us and this can go out to consultation, give some sort. So the sooner we can get this happening for this really uh, strategically crucial area that uh, does need duplication, then the better as far as I'm concerned. So uh, the, what we have before us looks like a pretty good start. So I, I warmly endorse it and uh, seek unanimous know, support. Pinkton. Oh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Look, only the point about the... Uh, <coughs> You know, make sure we work further to, to make sure we don't lose all that land that we could potentially include in the Gilson Bay uh, <coughs> recreation area. So as long as we can uh, resolve that and not have it split in half by the, the, the proposed design here, I think it'll all work out. Um, keep everyone happy. Other speakers? Alderman Bromley. Mr Mayor, I'm travelling stretch of road every single day and isn't it just about time? A former resident of uh, Clinton Road um, I, I, for, for, for many years. Last time I was here actually, Used to bang on about it then. Right. Uh, all those years ago, Alderman Jones. And, uh, um, Mr Mayor, it's, sorry, uh, it's, it's, so tonight I'm very, uh, delighted to see this here and um, certainly urge uh, the support of colleagues. Other speakers? Alderman Mulder. Uh, yes, um, welcome and look forward to it. Um, potential intersection there for the uh, future Flagstaff <laughs> Government <laughs> in Brighton. Um, but uh, also, um, there is a section of road that's even worse. And that's from the Risdon round, the Risdon Bay roundabout uh, through to the Bowen Bridge end, yeah. um, and and that area is worse, and really should have been given priority over this. But um, anyway, we're thankful for small mercy. Right, reply, Alderman Uh Look, uh, they're all lovely and meritorious, uh, Your Worship. But uh, <laughs> what we have before us is something that is well well designed, well along the route, and uh, looks like it's been been pretty well funded too. Uh, why is this the priority issue? It's a priority issue because uh, Gilston Bay High is no longer and Lindisfarne North has got a lot further north and the, uh, the pinching around getting in and out of the school as well as the, uh, just the increased traffic in general uh, means that, that, that this is a really key thing. So um, that, is, that is the area of the drive when you turn out of Derwin Avenue and, and get to the Bowen Bridge that requires the, the most concentration. Uh, because the the uh, yeah the intersection and the conflict that's happening is significant. So uh, as for what everybody said, uh, hoping for unanimous support for it. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Thank you. So the motion is we uh, note the uh, plans and authorise the GM to liaise to optimise the uh, play space there for our parks. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. 11.5.2 uh, is levelling the playing field grant deed at Anzac Park. Moved Alderman Longley, seconded Alderman Newington. Alderman Longley. Thank you Mr Mayor. Uh, this has been worked through at a workshop. Um, I think to sense a way forward um, to, um, to, to reallocate the $100,000 uh, from that particular program so we can progress this one. Um, obviously uh, there's a lot more money at time and effort that will be required but as a uh, first step it's a very sensible move. So I commend, uh, commend the motion. Thanks, Alderman Newey. Uh, yeah, just to agree with Alderman Blomley there, yes. Um, you know, we've got some uh, reasonably good playing surfaces out there, but we certainly need to upgrade a lot of our sporting facilities and, and the work that the council did, um, uh, Ross Graham and his staff, to uh, at short notice to put the work together, or the documents together to, um, uh, to get all this organised. Uh, you know, it's great to get it done. I mean, look, I know it was, you know, with all the other things that are going on, so I'd like to, um, you know, say well done to them to actually for finally getting it this far. And I hope the rest of the aldermen, uh, you know, can see the benefit in, in, in creating this sort of infrastructure to keep the, health, the community healthy and fit and active. And, uh, you know, as we all know, we've got a bit of work to do to, to find the uh, resources and, and a way of keeping it within a, some sort of form of budget. But oh, I certainly think this sort of stuff is our bread and butter and we should be looking at trying to do whatever we can to, to uh, bring this sort of stuff online. Other speakers? Okay, so the motion is that we um, first of all authorise the GM to sign the deed, amend the estimates, and prepare a design for a workshop to consider. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. 11.5.3 is Victoria Esplard and Kangaroo Bluff uh, Landscape Plan Review. Alderman Blomley, thank you. Second, Alderman Pearce. Alderman Blomley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Again, um, this is fairly well. Um, been fairly well socialised amongst colleagues. <coughs> I will note that um, Alderman James, if I recall, was the um, instigator of, um, of this particular approach. Um, it, it is pleasing to see that there's been some community consultation, although I will just again place on the record my um, reservations with some of the platforms that we use. I know it's, uh, it's difficult to get it right, to get a, to get a, whole, a holistic sort of view of the community, but I am um, somewhat concerned when um, 39 responses to the online survey sort of represent a, uh, uh, purported to represent a, a view, albeit they're all very similar in their responses, uh, I will just sort of place on the record that I have. I do have hesitation with um, small amounts of people, um, you know, uh, uh, um, leading public, uh, public decisions in this way. Having said that, I think it's a fantastic approach and certainly in response to our earlier council decision, um, and particularly that we engage with, we have engaged with our community, we'll continue to do so, and obviously work towards um, developing a landscape plan for that um, Victoria Split Island Kangaroo Bluff area. Thank you. Yes. Well, I've just got a question, Mayor. No, no worries with the recommendation, but I'm just saying I think this is very important, especially for this area. And it's got Victoria Split Island Kangaroo Bay Bluff area to be presented to a future council workshop prior to further public consultation. That's fine, no argument with that. But after the public consultation, it doesn't come back to a workshop, it just accounts who adopt it. Is it coming back to a workshop before it actually comes to a meeting? Um, just have a look at it, see what's going on. Um, oh, good, thank you. It just doesn't say that, that's all. Other, other speakers? In that case, I'll put the motion for approval. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. 11.5.4, Stormwater System Management Plan for 2019. Thanks, Alderman Blomley. Second, Alderman Kennedy. Alderman Blomley. As per the recommendation, Mr. Thank you. Other speakers? Motion then, once again, the Council adopts the Stormwater Management Plan for 2019. All in favour? Carried unanimously. Yeah, it's a 11.5.5, uh, 17A Frederick Henry Parade, from Warren. Alderman von Berte, uh, do we have Thank a second, you, please? Man. It is with great Alderman pleasure <laughs> that I actually put this forward. Thank second you. Do you need to say uh, a second up? Yes, oh, yeah, yeah. Second. Sorry. Uh, I think that this actually, after a number of workshops and a lot of deliberation with the community, covers the short term 
through to the longer term. So uh, I think, uh, and it balances out the various aspects of community support or concern. So thank you. Mr. Mayor, I can't perfect upon perfection. <laughs> Any other speakers? I just would like you to say yes, Mr. Mayor. Look, um, this matter has, as you probably read in the officer's report, been ongoing for a number of years, and I know when. Anyway, uh, at the actually up at the Act Council's um, right of way up to the top of the hill, there was a number of motions and they've been already considered and um, investigated over the years and and as early as um, 2007 when I think Alden von Berto met with a number of residents I think when you basically came to council you I think you took on this issue uh, and ran with it for how many years you've been here now? Quite a while. Uh, Alderman yeah, James, sorry, please keep yeah. the topic. Yeah, OK. Sorry, yes. Look, um, I digress. Look, thanks very much. Uh, but anyway, look, um, I didn't necessarily agree with the ceiling of it. But look, that's what the community input and what the responses have been, Mr Mayor. So look, I will support this recommendation and hopefully if we can, in fact, um, sign off on this subject to budget time, of course, because that's listed there quite clearly. And uh, I'll support the recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Right reply. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. And <coughs> moving on to governance. 11.7.1 is the quarterly report to the 30th of September be received. Uh, Alden Moller, second of Alden Bromley. Uh, Alderman Bromley, uh, would you like to speak to the motion? Um, I actually have some questions, is that? Is well, that uh, you have the opportunity if you want to. So am I the mover or the seconder? You're the seconder. Okay. Right. Um, and then thank, thank you, Mr Mayor, and um, thank you, colleagues, for your indulgence. I refer colleagues to page 24 uh, of the uh, Alderman Portley report under, pla under city planning. And at the bottom of that page, it says, it's under heading planning approvals, we're told that there were 195 development and subdivision applications determined in the quarter. This is a 33% increase from the previous quarter. All applications were determined within the statutory timeframes. So Mr Mayor, the question through you to either the general manager or the manager of city planning is, considering there's been a 33% increase in applications and our city growth is can be yeah, likely to continue. Um, and I'm aware that the new residential controls and planning scheme introduced in 2010, and of course in recent times, it, it's becoming increasingly um, um, complicated, both in reporting and obviously the decisions that, that we're having to make. Um, my, my concern is, with that sort of increase, and our staffing levels at the same, le at the same level, are there adequate resources or is there a concern that, that in the next budget cycle, there may be a need to look at additional resources in this very important area. Um, thank you for the question, Alderman Blomley. Um, uh, the short answer to your question is yes, we are under a lot of um, pressure at the moment in terms of our uh, staffing resources in the planning area. Uh, Mr Lovell and I uh, and uh, Ms Doubleday um, have been meeting pretty much on a fortnightly basis to work through that and uh, work out what capacity within the budget we've got to, uh, to make changes. Um, I will say though that uh, one of the points of discussion uh, during the budget cycle for next year uh, will be to uh, look very closely at the, uh, the level of planning activity and what we can do to, uh, to alleviate that pressure. At this point in time we are re relying on some consultant support uh, but long term that's not a sustainable option for us nor is it cost effective. Thank you. Sure. I refer to page um, uh, 29 uh, of the uh, quarterly report under the heading Environmentally Responsible City, and with particular uh, reference to natural area management, the charge mark grant applications, 
And of course, this refers to the uh, electric vehicle charger they received a grant for uh, for the council office car park with the installation planned for next year. Through you, Mr Mayor, as the general manager or one of his officers, I would be more specific as to when this EV uh, charger will, become, will come online. Was there one more? There is, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I refer to page uh, 81 of the quarterly report on the Capital Works, and I note um, project number 500143, which is 138 East Stewart Highway Car Park. This is the potential Hill Street Grocer development, um, and we're told here it's therefore dependent on whether that development proceeds. Um, do we have a, an understanding as to whether the Hill Street Grocer development will proceed or not? Level? No, we have no information at this time. Thank you. Okay, other speakers in terms of the quality reports? On Walker. Yes, I also, uh, to perhaps elaborate more on, again, that page 29 and the uh, charge smart grant application. As it states there, council was successful in obtaining a grant of $2,000, $2,500. Uh, uh, am I able to be informed of what council's uh, costing will be, if you like, for this Bowser? Um, uh, Mr. Graham? Uh, through Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll take up on notice as well and provide information on the costing and the time frame. Be um, so, again, on that uh, process, um, is Given that there was a, a notice of motion in relation to support of this transport modality that was successful some meetings back, uh, is the intention that this will be rate funded, rate payer funded power going into into this process with no contribution from the user, or is council looking at some user contribution or in, into into people that will be availing of it? Um, again, sorry. Forward to a full report on it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Graham. Uh, any other questions on the quarterly reports? In that case, um, I'll put the motion that it be received. All those in favour? All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Um, sorry. Eleven point seven point two, public open space policy amendment to expand the valuation service providers. Thank you, Alderman Warren. Second, Alderman Blomley. Would you like to speak to it, Alderman Warren? Um, no, we discussed this well at a workshop, so as the recommendation. Thank you. Workshop four. Um, do you wish to speak to the motion, Alderman Blomley? <laughs> Other speakers. In that case, put the motion. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. 11.7.3 is the Reconciliation Plan and Aboriginal Heritage Report. I propose to deal with these at seriatim with A, uh, first of all being to develop a project plan for Tier 2 Recreation Action Plan. Thank you, Alderman Kennedy. Do I have a seconder for that, please? Yes. Uh, thanks, Alderman Pearce. Would you like to speak to it? Thank you, just as per the recommendation. Thank you. Alderman Piers. Alderman Warren, did you wish to speak to that? Other speakers? Alderman Ewington. Um, well, we're talking about IMA. <coughs> Look, I, if there's anything we could do to um, move down the path of reconciliation in our community, I'm all for it. Um, however, how many different gov levels of government are going to be looking at this issue? We've got federal government dealing with it, we've got state government dealing with it, and now we want to put our toe in the water and spend right post money, again, tie up our staff, who we've already identified are overwhelmed with what they do, and whatever we spend on it is one issue, but how much staff time is going to go into dealing with it? Um, and to be honest, when we sat there and listened to the report being presented and the discussion, um, just a clarification here. Um, the first part we're dealing with is uh, the briefing that was given by Mr Bill Lawson. Yes, well, the, the second part is the report we received. 
Okay, well the report that we received relates to... Which, which is part B. Yeah, I know, I get that. <laughs> but it relates to why I have concerns that the reconciliation yeah. action plan would actually be that effective when we have a situation where the Aboriginal community can't even agree on who is Aboriginal and who isn't. Now, rightly, look, just because it seems like a good thing to do and it may be beneficial does not mean that it necessarily is a good thing to do. And like I said, I mean, spending great post money, duplicating what's already going on at state and federal, tying up our staff in something that, you know, I might be a little bit not sure about what the outcome might be on this and, and how it might help, but I, I just think it, it's just duplication of things that are already going on, and I don't think uh, it's something that we should get involved in, to be honest. Thank you. I'll speak to Alderman and then Alderman Edmonds. Um, I had the opportunity to go to an Aboriginal Cultural Respect um, Training Day at Wisden Cove a couple of weeks ago and I would recommend to all aldermen if they have the chance to go that to something like that to take the opportunity because it really brought home to me how little I know on this issue in our own backyard and in our own society and I would urge all aldermen to, to educate themselves. Alderman Ewington, uh, Edmund, sorry. Yeah, I support it. I'll just make one comment about the sort of the Aboriginal community speaking with one voice. Because if someone flew down from Melbourne and wanted to know what the priorities for the Eastern Shore are, they would meet with the Mayor, they would meet with the Federal Member, they would meet with State Members, they would meet with individual aldermen. And they, of course we're not all going to speak with the same voice. So I think it's sort of, I don't like that one part of the community gets pigeonholed with that, when if you dealt with almost any other group, you deal with cyclists, you deal with anyone, they're not all going to be speaking with the same voice. So I just would like to place that on record. James. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and I appreciate that there was this separation of, of, these, uh, of the recommendations because um, uh, there is, are concerns that I have with regard to um, the composition of this um, group that will be presumably covering all those aspects of, um, of, of what um, the RAP will, uh, will be involved. And, I still believe, and, and uh, it's interesting that Alderman Warren mentioned about the meeting over at um, Bowen Park uh, with those Aboriginal groups. There has been a, a long-term sort of standoff, if I could say that, in relation to the TAC being the spokes organisation for the, the community, not only on the Western Shore, but also on the on the um, uh, eastern shore. Now, given that there is a composition uh, of state, federal, uh, local representatives, and of course, to make uh, to have any plan proceed, there has to be the Aboriginal component as well. And my concern here is, and it's also a, com a comment that I'll make in, with respect to Part B, which is a separate motion altogether. And that is that there has been a number of um, groups that I believe haven't been able to have their say in relation to uh, cultural matters, um, Aboriginal matters that pertain to those smaller Aboriginal groups. And therefore my concern is that it's great to have a plan, but at the same time it may be uh, to the um, exclusive of those groups that are of a minor uh, speaking group in the community, Aboriginal community, and that it becomes sort of a, a, um, a process for uh, the other TAC to sort of run with. I, I don't know as to, as to whether we should be in, um, going down this course, and, and I know Bill Lawson <coughs> has been a, a really dedicated person in relation to this, and he's been at the forefront of, um, as a spokesperson and uh, pursuing the RAPs throughout Australia. I, I understand that. But at the same time, I think that before we go down this track, uh, or course, that we need to consider the ramifications of smaller groups and that may not necessarily have the voice or the, the power, if you want to use that term, to be able to speak out and identify all community, uh, Aboriginal community groups 
and may get lost in this bureaucracy that encompass, incorporates federal, state, local and probably key Aboriginal communities. If I could just uh, put in my two bobs worth there. I, in response to what Alderman James has just said, I think uh, we could make it a condition, uh, an objective as any RAP that we undertook to ensure that all uh, elements, uh, including those smaller groups, be included in the overall plan. So I, I think it's not as though that be discarded straight away, that there is an opportunity for us to insist that you know they be represented in our ongoing plans. But anyway, that's my comment. Uh, Alderman Mulder. Thank you very much. I, um, there is some comfort in here that um, the Tasmanian Re Reconciliation Council is uh, actually part <coughs> of this. And the Tasmanian Reconciliation Council has a, has a long and a strong history, not only uh, the Reconciliation Council of Tasmania, but also nationally for engaging those outlying groups. And, and Tasmania has a particular issue. But there is also the uh, Tasmanian Regional Aboriginal Community Association, which, um, uh, which is headed by uh, Mr. Dillon, who is uh, well respected in, um, in, in sort of uh, in, in um, both communities. Um, and the fact is, yes, there is a civil war going on in those particular communities, um, and that is a matter that um, we aren't going to resolve. And it's no excuse to sit on our hands and say. Uh, we've got to wait for them to finish their civil war before we can do anything. The Tasmanian Reconciliation uh, Council um, has a track record um, and they are, they are the people who are going to go forward and deliver, deliver this plan. And if you uh, read Dr Brown's uh, report, uh, or his so-called plan, which isn't really a plan at all, <laughs> um, it's a report and that um, it needs to, it, 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 it's in there and it's identified some of these groups that are members of neither the Regional Aboriginal Corporation Association or the Tasmanian Aboriginal Council. And Dr Brown's report will push Reconciliation Tasmania to actually speaking with those people and recognising those people. So that's, I think, the benefit of where we're at. Um, it is a bit unfortunate that, um, and, and it's a comment for recommendation B, but I can, I'll, I'll make it now, so I'll be speaking later, is that it's called a plan when it's not. It's a report. It's a report to guide us and to Reconciliation Tasmania, should this motion be successful, in the way forward. And, uh, and that is to be commended. Um, I also note that, um, that you know, I'll leave a comment to Dr Brown's report. Thank you. Other speakers. Right of reply, Alderman Kennedy. So the motion is that we um, actually see, go for a project plan for tier two of a wrap. Okay. All those in favour? Against? The motion is carried. Now we move to part B, which uh, the recommendation is that we receive Dr Brown's report and endorse recommendations in attachment three of that report. If I could have a move and seconder, please. Moved Alderman Warren, do I have a second up? Alderman Kennedy, thank you. Alderman Warren, would you like to speak to it? I, I, just as per the recommendation, but I, I also want to make, the take, make one point and ask a question, if that's okay. Oh. Um, this refers to doing things that are feasible and achievable right now. Um, I, I note that we have um, an Aboriginal flag flying outside, but we don't have it flying all the time. I wonder if somebody could explain to me why that is. A uh, council decision was to fly it only uh, for um, Aboriginal Week. The, yeah. I think that's perhaps something we could revisit as part of this. And the other point that I want to make um, is that one thing that, that I learned at my training day was that at the time of invasion there were actually nine separate Aboriginal nations in Tasmania. Did you know that? through the mayor. <laughs> so these were nine separate nations with their own culture, their own languages, their own traditions. Um, you know, it's like Africa is nine separate countries. Why would you expect them all to agree? Um, so I commend the motion. Thank you. Alderman Kennedy. Other speakers? Alderman James? Uh, yes, Mr Mayor. Um, this um, uh, second item uh, refers to the um, attachment three. And attachment three is on, obviously, on pages, oh, it's at the back anyway, um, 
and it says endorses the recommendations included in attachment three um, and actions are feasible within the current budget. Again, I have concerns that on attachment three, it's okay, it, it refers to the Bedlam Walls Aboriginal site as managed properly, okay, no problems. However, to commence liaison with the following ta Tasmanian Aboriginal organisations regarding Risdon Cove. Now look, again, that's my understanding, the TAC had, is the managing authority for um, that area. They have it under their um, umbrella as part and parcel of the, um, of the, 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 the deed that was done between the Groom government at the time when there was the handover of that land to the Aboriginal community and I believe the TAC is the actual agency, uh, sorry, uh, Aboriginal body that is responsible for it and also the Aboriginal Land Council of Tasmania and the chairperson of that is Michael Mansell. Now again, I, I don't want to really start <coughs> splitting hairs again but <coughs> recommendation two is centred around the TAC and also the Aboriginal Land Care Council of Tasmania and I believe it doesn't uh, incorporate as I thought Mr Brown's uh, uh, basic uh, thrust was to in, in, uh, engross all of these particular Aboriginal communities but it doesn't appear to be the case under that recommendation too. Okay, uh, interpretation panels, etc. no problems with that. Uh, and also, uh, council uh, obviously uh, consults with the Aboriginal community, which I think we are currently doing anyway, and the chair of the Tracks and Trails could obviously answer that question uh, in relation to a part of the procedures that, that has to be in, uh, in considered as any new track or trail that's being uh, proposed within the city and we have a lot of middens as I understand it along the foreshore and that's where the, the Clarence foreshore trail is, is, is obviously being pursued. So look uh, again these recommendations um, uh, 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 and again um, uh, under the general recommendations tracks and trails we've got a number of these that um, uh, again are incorporated as part of uh, attachment three so we've got a, a very broad brush uh, number of recommendations which by the very nature of the officer's recommendation is um, incorporating and endorsing these recommendations. And I have some real concerns and that's why I was pleased Mr Mayor that we did separate these two um, matters for consideration. And because of that and again it just seems to be weighted for two in particular particular Aboriginal groups to the, I believe, the disadvantage of other uh, community, uh, Aboriginal groups uh, that I, I will not support the recommendation. Other speakers? Alderman Mulder. <coughs> I do have some concerns that um, Although it's described as the report on interpreting Aboriginal heritage, we then go on to talk about recommended actions for interpretation of Aboriginal heritage in Clarence. Now, taking aside, and uh, trying to divorce it, is well, when we rush in and do interpretations, and we're only taking the TAC's advice, we are in fact perpetuating the divisions, the very things that the Reconciliation Council is supposed to try to get over. And, and you might say, well, you know, a bit of interpretation here and there. The report also is quite adamant that the um, Palawatani Kitaki, uh, Kani language should be the preferred use for the historical sites. You go and pop down and have a talk to the Tasmanian Regional Aboriginals Communities Association and ask them what they think of Palawatani. It's a made up language derived from, uh, derived from a, uh, a couple of um, sort of uh, papers submitted by uh, uh, 1830s explorers um, and it's how you got names like Nipaluna for Hobart. Now, the only basis for that was is that a white person spoke to an Aboriginal aide and said, what's that down there? And apparently the word was Nipaluna. We don't know whether it means white is town or, <laughs> or um, 
you know, to invade this country. We don't know what it means. And, and, and therefore, you know, you've got to be a little bit careful with those sorts of words. Um, and, and that alone was the first thing that sparked up the Tasmanian Regional Aboriginal Corporation Association. So I, I think we might be just treading our toes into a bit of water that the Reconciliation Commission might be in a better place to deal with than we are. Um, so I would suggest, and, and, and I'll, um, I'll be voting against Part B, but uh, perhaps uh, foreshadowing an alternative motion that, uh, that, stops, that just stops at Council receiving Dr Brown's report on, on to interpreting um, Aboriginal heritage in Clarence, full stop. Thank you. Other speakers? Uh, just to be clear, uh, there's attachment three. There's the recommendations listed in attachment three. Um, and then there's the actual report with its executive summary and, and each and every component. Am I right to say we're being silent on those elements and not saying we endorse them or disendorse them? They're just kind of there. Three years from now, um, as a result of workshops, um, we were just recommending that the report be received, that council doesn't form an opinion in any way in, in regard to endorsing a Dr Brown's report or otherwise, or his views. Um, um, but we need to uh, repeat the report because it contains information on which to chair the Sorry, just, just, just again, I, I'm talking about being silent on, on the element. There are elements that were in there that are not in attachment three, and so that's, that's the areas that we're being silent on. But I, I don't accept the premise that we're just receiving the report, because if we were just receiving the report, there would be no attachment three. So there are some, some elements within the whole report that I think are just... Fabulous, just some really sensible things that we need to get onto straight away. And there are some other elements that, that I've got some significant troubles with. And, and I don't think we've sort of finessed this. I think it's sort of a cross your fingers and see how you go process. Um, and that's of a concern. for raising their concerns and I thank uh, Mr Tui for the clarification and, and I agree with Alderman Walker. I think there are some really useful things in this report and the recommendations. Um, we don't necessarily have to implement all of them. I think the wording that actions that are feasible um, gives us a little bit of wriggle room and, and I think it's actually a shame that we've decoupled the two points because I think we should be very much guided by uh, reconciliation, Tasmania and Bill Lawson and people who actually know a lot more about this than we do. I feel quite uncomfortable with us making decisions in this area about what's right and what isn't when I know that we don't have that knowledge. Um, so I um, commend the, the second part B to um, the council, to the alderman, on the understanding that, as Alderman Walker points out, there are simple things that we could do right now that would cost us nothing but would go a long way to um, making a positive contribution to improving our relationships and other things that might require a little bit more thought and a bit more guidance from somebody who knows the landscape a lot better than we do. So I commend the motion. Thank you. 
Motion, all those in favour? Against? The motion is carried. Uh, 11.7.4, the Kangaroo Bay Boulevard site, uh, that Council agrees to extend the preferred developer agreement to the 30th of right. March. Thanks, Alderman Edmonds. Second up. Alderman Ewington, thank you. Alderman Edmonds. Keep my comments very brief, but this is a step in the right direction. Um, I think the fact that they've listened and said, yep, yeah, we'll do more consultation and actually take on board suggestions is really good. Um, I have seen the extent of some of those already and you know, it might not be exactly how I'd do it, but at least it's being done. Um, I often hear when we talk about consultation, you know, there's some people who'll never be happy. Well, that's absolutely true, but there's plenty who will. And I think a lot of people like to talk about silent majorities, well I think there's a bit of a silent majority there who just want to know what's going on and then if they want to become part of the process, whether it's for or against indifferent feedback to aldermen, I think that's great that more people would know about it. Um, and I'll just make the last point that people or developers hopefully will start to realise that more consultation, consultation equals more support for their projects. Um, thank you Mr Mayor. Uh, look, I suppose, yeah, consultation is great, uh, but there comes a point where decisions need to be made, and, um, and I think in this one where it's interesting, look, if we had a pushed ahead with it, there would have been claims that we rushed it all through Christmas and tried to stop people having a say. Um, so we've taken that one out of the equation now. Um, and in light of what I've seen with the last uh, Kangaroo Bay Hotel and what seems to be happening with um, other proposed developments around the place, uh, all these claims of... Uh, maladministration or something untoward or something uh, illegal or whatever happening or you know some pretty strong uh, you know claims being made out there and I think you know we've done a very good job of giving everyone an opportunity to, to put their point forward but I think we also need to remember that there are plenty of people out there that you know like me have been waiting a long time to see something happen through that space and I think that um, we should keep in mind the people that don't necessarily get in here and the fact that we need to um, I said make a decision and not let the vocal minority that we always hear from um, cause us to get a little bit shaky at times. So let's hope we get there and uh, can actually make a decision on this one within three months or so. Thank you. Yes, look, uh, thanks Mr Mayor and it was interesting to read the, uh, the article today's Mercury from Alderman Warren or their comments in that article from Alderman Warren and all of Alderman Edmonds. And I think what it stems from the fact that um, more time is required in order for uh, Hunter to undertake uh, broader and more extensive community consultation on its proposal. And also it would seem to incorporate changes into the design gathered from the consultation process. And I believe the consultation process is, is just paramount to what the, the, the process is in relation to this. What we are talking about here is the um, preferred develop, developer status, which was awarded in May 2018. And it would seem to me that one of the, um, or the families that has had some real concerns in relation to the Boulevard development are the Scots. And it would seem as though that as part of the first round of consultation that their view corridors have been addressed. That's what I've heard from a number of uh, people and uh, I haven't actually spoken to the Scots but I do know about two years ago when this was, was basically being considered they had some real concerns even on the, on the mud map or whatever you call it, the, the model which was floated, you know, in essence on what the different types of construction would be along, along the foreshore. So look, by um, extending the um, a PDA to the 30th of March 20, it does overcome one of the issues that I think is important and that is that I really hope that some of the uh, persons that um, have expressed concern other than the Scots to this point 
and will be approached, and I'm talking about those in Pembroke Place where there is a number of um, concerns, particularly as part of their view corridors and, uh, and, the, and the size and scale of the development. But by allowing this to proceed to the 30th of March, which I will support, because I think any part of the consultation process, which means that there's going to be more extensive community consultation on this, then I think it, it's going to be a win-win. However, if by at the end of that timeline, and if there, it seems to be just a, a factor that Hunter is pursuing because it just needs a little bit extra time, then OK, let's look at the DA at the time and make an assessment on that, Mr Mayor. So look, I will support this. I think what, and the comments that were made in the paper by Alderman Warren and Alderman Edmonds are quite appropriate. And uh, I think that it's giving the community a bit more time and also for Hunter to be able to dot their I's and cross their T's as far as the consultation process. And hopefully during that timeline, there will be those issues resolved particularly with regard to those uh, residents there in Pembroke Place. Thank you. Mr Mayor, it seems to me that they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. All right, people ask for further cons community consultation. That's what's happening. I think we should all just get on with the show, say, well done, Hunter. You're talking to the people of Clarence. Get on and talk to them, come back to this place once you've, you've had this extra time of consultation, and let's move forward with this uh, this proposal. Thank you. Other speakers? Alderman Mulder. Alderman Blomley and Alderman James in vicious agreement there. Oh, um, uh, 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 I don't. Uh, uh, let's keep to the topic, please, without interruption. Alderman Mulder. I was complimenting on the two gentlemen. <laughs> I thought that was the topic. I don't need gratuitous uh, compliments from anyone, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, can we or continue, please? <laughs> Well, through the chair, Mr. Mayor. Um, please. Now, this was granted in March 2020. We saw nothing of Boulevard, of the Boulevard development, until about six or eight weeks ago. Then we get this huge proposal that. Um, Although uh, I think privately most of us say is just over the top and isn't going to happen, what I'm going to suggest is that perhaps um, we uh, look really at um, whether this consultation is going to produce anything different, given previous consultations, than what was presented before. It may be scaled back a little bit, but um, I would think that most of us would privately concede that 100 apartments and 95 parking spaces at a site that is supposed to be the uh, access way and provide parking for the future ferry service, which there is none, um, those sorts of developments, um, I can't really see how this is going too much further. As preferred developers, uh, we've had plenty of time, um, and I uh, would probably be a lone voice in suggesting that um, they uh, either get on with it, um, and if they haven't after all this time been able to get on with it, uh, then uh, maybe we should find someone who can come up with something that we, we would like. But anyway. Thank you. Other speakers? Mr. Walker. I think the extra time being uh, granted, if you like, by the developer, because basically this is ultimately something that was in their carriage and power to do, is, is to be uh, commended. But separate to that, we're not going to be able to consult our way to consensus on this matter. That isn't, that isn't going to happen. But hopefully with the extra time, um, people will, ha even if they get to a point where they are not uh, satisfied or endearing of the, the final outcome, at least will have had an opportunity to, to air their views or get their thoughts together to, to make um, representations around those matters. So um, for, an, for a couple of extra months, I think this is a reasonable way forward. But again, anybody that's uh, entertaining ideas that we're going to consult to consensus around this, uh, I think is, is heading for disappointment. Mr. Mayor, I think 
take it really quite. Um, a lot of people at this table came at this from with a very different sort of first sentence about the topic, but I actually think there is a lot of agreement about the way forward with this and some acknowledgements about exactly what Alderman Walker said about you can't consultate your way to consensus. But these sort of huge, like really big, important, you know, job creating, investment creating um, developments in the heart of our city should be allowed to breathe in the public debate and discourse of our city. Now, a few mentions of the Mercury article, and yes, a bit of flack and consequences for doing that story, but it was worth it because people are talking about it and opinions are yep. being aired out. And in fact, you know, pressure works in different ways. And um, part of that is communication, part of that is official channels. So absolutely stand by going down that path. And I, I know I mentioned it in closed meeting at our last meeting that we might not be able to sort of find you know, consensus, but we can communicate our way towards more of it. And anything that sort of opens up more discourse, more debate, more opinions, and a lot of those opinions are probably what Alderman Newington referred to, of people who do just, do just want things to, to get, you know, to happen. But I think we can't guess <coughs> on stuff that is, you know, of this, of this magnitude. So I think there's consensus that we will support this recommendation, but I just wanted to put some of those things uh, on record and again just re reiterate my point that people and developers will start to realise that more consultation equals more support. Okay. So the motion is that we agree to extend the preferred development agreement to the 30th of March. All those in favour? Against? Motion is carried. Item 12, Waterman's question time. At 12.1 and 12.2 there's no matters. 12. Uh, there's answers to previous questions on notice, which are in the agenda. Sorry, that's 12.4. 12.5, questions without notice. I think Alderman Warren might be the to start. Alderman James. Oh, yes, look, thanks very much. I only got one question tonight, so that's <laughs> speed the process up. Yep. Look, um, my question through you to, um, I think, no, to the general manager might be appropriate. Look, um, when um, representatives obviously submit their representation following the advertising of a, of a DA, is there any uh, means by which uh, the representatives can be advised that the item is coming up for consideration at that council, at the council meeting? Because at the moment, a lot of them don't know about the issue. They're not contact. Well, there's no contact between council staff and the um, and the representer. So, is there any means by which either in writing or a phone call? And I know this may be a, a, a admin uh, cost, but is there any way in which they can be advised that um, the item is coming up for consideration by the council? following their representation that they've lodged in accordance with the statutory process. Um, so I'll turn that one on. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, couple. Uh, I'm aware that there's a delay with our all uh, abilities swing with the, some issues from the delivery company. I just wonder if there's any update. Uh, uh, through Mr. no, I don't have any update. Oh, sorry, second question. That would be great because obviously we had a very specific date in mind for that being delivered. Uh, yeah, the other one is about, um, I had a couple of uh, grumpy um, small business owners today and I appreciate particularly um, Mr Graham's response when it was raised. But I, I have some sort of concerns that s small businesses who rely on the passing traffic, the communication they got from... Um, our, our um, contractor was very vague about how the interruptions would work and and these businesses basically had no traffic past them and no business between 9 and 3.30. So what I'm wondering is, is perhaps when this uh, roadworks are concluded, 
um, there could be a review about how that happened and specifically um, if we can find out if there will be a full road closure again this week and if we can, if there is, we can pass it on. Is that and Clarence I, Street or what? Yeah, Clarence yeah. Street. Oh, Clarence. Okay. And I, I will again reiterate my appreciation of Mr Graham's um, feedback and support today. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I have two questions. Um, first one is, um, has Council taken steps to identify what port infrastructure is required on the eastern shore to support a Sullivan's Cove to Bell Reef ferry service? Thank you for the question. Um, preliminary work has been carried out by the State Government um, and that's included um, TAS ports in terms of ferry terminal infrastructure, um, Department of State growth in terms of uh, the <coughs> strategic planning for those, uh, those assets and uh, involvement from Metro in terms of public transport. Um, however, uh, at this point in time, while Council has been consulted and, and informed along the, that process, um, it's still at a very conceptual stage. There's nothing firmly committed at this point in time. <coughs> we would expect uh, further consultation and more detail to occur um, in all likelihood coming out of the um, uh, city deal implementation plan processes. Mayor, I thank the general manager through you for that uh, that answer, and I assume that that, that answer as well as the next one hopefully will be included in the minutes that starts meeting. Yes. Thank you. So my second question, Mr. Mayor, is has council considered if the expanded Bell Reef Marina will impact on wharf access for a commuter ferry service? Um, thanks uh, again for that question. Um, the commuter ferry service um, that is being considered by uh, DSG um, is currently, as I understand it, uh, proposing to use the hotel site as a, um, as a uh, departure and, and boarding point. Um, in consultation, or in, sorry, in conversation with MAST over the last couple of weeks, um, the, they are satisfied that, at least at this preliminary stage, uh, they're comfortable with those arrangements. There's certainly no detail regarding uh, size of vessel and so forth, but certainly MAST are comfortable with the Bell Reef Yacht Club um, DA uh, in terms of where that's located and the, uh, the entry points in there. Um, there has been some discussion with the um, operators of the Mona Ferry because they periodically come in to the marina, but they, uh, they uh, uh, deliver passengers to a different area um, and we've got some ongoing going consultation with them at this point. Robin Pearce. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we went tonight earlier where there's going to be another rubbish bin on uh, Rosney Hill, which is fantastic. I'm just wondering, could we can it be put further away from the other one because, God, it's a mess up there at times. I think the Colonel's got a lot to answer for. Uh, the other question is Kangaroo Bay. Because we're getting, or it looks like we'll get some development around the Kangaroo Bay area, the fence, the fence around the sports oval still worries me. Cricket balls can go onto the road, they can injure a person, and if start, some development starts going there, there's going to be a lot more traffic there. And as I said, I've raised this before, and I really fear that a cricket ball is going to be hit out of that ground at Kangaroo Bay and really hurt somebody. Hold on, Walker. Yes. Um, first question relates to um, the Victoria Swanard Kangaroo Bluff 2013 landscape plan review and consultation feedback. Uh, are we on track to be looking at actually discussing uh, budget items around this in the next upcoming budget to be actually doing some remediate, some actual enhancements and improvements to the site? Uh, well, um, Mr. Graham. Uh, I would say that we're probably doubtful in terms of the site being ready to go at this point. We'll start discussions in March. Yes, sir. Um, so for us to come back to a council workshop. Walker, as I understand it, the motion that you originally yep. brought to council and the one that we reaffirmed tonight yep. was that we wouldn't spend any money on Victoria Esplanade until the plan was finished. I'm just 
asking if that's likely to be occurring at that time. Yeah. Oh, so your question is, will the plan be we'll finished? We'll be in a, in a spate so that we'll be discussing it in the upcoming budget. Okay. Uh, Mr Graham, do you have an uh, idea of when we can have the plan come to Council for endorsement? I don't have a time frame, uh, Mr Graham, but I'll take that one notice. I'll talk to my design staff and have a time frame. I don't think it was Council's intention that nothing happened for a long period of time. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> Alderman Walker. Uh, question number two, and um, there'll be a Christmas hand coming if you can answer this one without taking it on notes. No bribery. Uh, what I'd like to know <coughs> is uh, the complete cost to date of the uh, South Arm Skate Park project, including <coughs> tender construction costs, legals, consultation costs. Uh, and itemising <coughs> these costs and other costs that have been involved to date. Uh, this matters because we've, we've got a lot of conjecture in the area about the project in general, coupled with the fact that we've, we've seen what we can spend for around about a million dollars. And I'm, I'm fearing that this Leyland P76 of a project is going to exceed those costs that we, that we got a brilliant skate park in Rosnickel. Have we got... Um, in a position to take a crisp Sam here, aren't we? Yeah, look, well, yeah, a couple of things. Um, well, I was, it's interesting, I mean, with all these uh, bushfires happening around the, uh, the country these days, and, and some people's belief that we're going to get more and more and more of them every day and every week. Um, I saw an ad in the Essential Sun about, uh, and I'll get to my question there, about bushfire <laughs> preparation. <laughs> where, where it said, you know, clear your block, but then it said, um, yeah, protect with us first. So the first question was, when was the last time we reviewed our land clearing policies in relation to bushfire prone areas? Uh, Mr Graham? Uh, I thought it was earlier this year. Our fire management strategy would have been the last time that we would have looked at some of that, and I think that was adopted within the last two years, but I can... Sorry to... Take it on notice again. And yeah, okay, no, that's fine. Because it'll just be interesting. Well, if it's more of a problem, well, we probably should have looked at it recently. Um, and the second one is, have we had any situations where residents have uh, made complaints about not being able to clear around their properties, uh, their own private land, and or council land hasn't been cleared to a standard that they thought was appropriate to protect their properties? Probably need to take that on notice as well. Yeah, no, I expect that, yeah. So if we can have a report on that, please. <coughs> Thank you, Alderman Kennedy. Uh, yes, just one thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, and I think this might be something that um, Mr Fig brought up, and I may it may be remiss of me for missing the answer, but um, when flooding occurs in a, um, an area zoned at high risk of inundation, sorry, um, where does the responsibility lie? Well, because uh, I, think the answer, I think the answer to Mr Fick's question was uh, it's complicated. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll just need to... It'll be an answer in a number of parts is, is my guess, and I'd rather have some time to think about it if I could. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr Mayor, I have two. Um, at the in a closed meeting uh, under the item of a, sport a sporting project, in the last council meeting, um, a decision was made to inform interested parties of our decision. In the absence of any community consultation around this issue, when, if ever, will the community be advised of our decision? Thank you for the question. Um, the um, closed meeting item uh, specified that when the uh, transaction was completed, um, there would be a report to council and that that would be publicly disclosed. <coughs> uh, the transaction is not completed at this stage. My second question uh, relates to um, the ferry and the, uh, which has often been touted by the state government for some time now as a, as a, as a park and ride solution to our traffic problems. In terms of the uh, parking component of that uh, park and ride, where is that parking to be located and what measures are we going to take 
to uh, to deal with the traffic uh, with, the, with the existing high level traffic problems on both Clarence Street and Cambridge Road. Thank you again for the question. Um, can I just ask a point of clarification? You're talking about the proposed ferry terminal for the Kangaroo Bay Hotel site? That's right. Um, at this point in time, as far as I'm aware, there is no proposal for a park and ride facility. Um, that the focus, as I understand it, has been upon alternative uh, forms of transport um, at, at that point. And it's, as I said earlier in my response to other questions, it's, uh, it's very much in a concept stage at this point in time and there are no firm plans one way or the other. I think uh, one of the ideas here, and as the general manager says, it's very conceptual, <coughs> is, is that there uh, be a real push for bike riding and uh, walking. Um, I don't think there's any intention to do park and ride in the traditional sense of the word. <laughs> well, uh, one of the problems is, of course, is where would you park? You have ask the question. All right, um, that brings us to closed session. Uh, there are no members of the public uh, remaining to thank, so if I could have a motion to go into close, please. Thanks, Alderman Pearce. Seconded, Alderman Edmonds. All those in favour? Uh, <coughs>